thanks everyone for joining us again for the Geomicrobiology Network seminar. And um, just a reminder, we're recording, so you can keep your cameras off if you'd like to, and we'll wait for questions to the end, or you can put them in the chat. And um, I'm thrilled today to, to introduce um, my longtime colleague and friend and, and fellow Berkeley survivor, uh, Dr. Clara Chan, who's at the University of Delaware and is double appointed or uh, joint appointed in uh, both the Department of Geological Sciences and the Delaware Biotechnology Institute. Um, is that within the School of Marine Science? Are they both within the School of Marine Science? Uh, our sciences is in marine, yeah. Well, it's now Earth, Ocean, and Environment. Right, okay. So, so Claire has been, been working across a lot of different milieu and environments from marine uh, to terrestrial, and uh, what can I say? She's had a, a, a pretty amazing career already. She's an associate professor at University of Delaware, um, where she's been uh, faculty since 2009, after uh, doing a postdoc from 2006 to 2008 at Woods Hole, and um, some visiting appointments at uh, Bowdoin and uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Clara has uh, received a lot of awards for her work, and I think a lot of us know her as, as doing groundbreaking science in the field of geomicrobiology of, of iron oxidizers. Some of these awards, most more recently, include the um, GSA Geobiology and Geomicrobiology Post Tenure Award, which she received uh, last, no, two years ago. It's 2021 now, so that was 2019. And um, in 2017, 2018, she spent much of, uh, one, what, the spring, I think, on, on tour as the Mineralogical Society of America's Distinguished Lecturer. Um, and from 2012 to 2017, she received and worked um, under an NSF Career Award, a very prestigious award um, for early to mid-career uh, researchers. Um, the list goes on, but I don't want to take up too much time away from Clara, who is very graciously joining us from Delaware at 7 a.m. her time this morning and um, has to run to teach at 8 a.m. So we're gonna cut her a little bit of slack at the end of this uh, seminar to get away so she can start uh, to, so you can prepare for her class. And um, I think I'd better shut up and let Clara take, take over now. Clara, I'm really thrilled that you could join us today. Thank you so much for joining us from, uh, from the States at such an early hour. So over to you. Thanks, John. I'm really happy to be here and talk to all of you about uh, our work. John and I have known each other since, well, we met at the very beginning of grad school because we started grad school together in Wisconsin and then in Berkeley. And we actually shared a field site. And knowing this would be recorded, I didn't include any embarrassing grad school <laughs> pictures, but I could. <laughs> and um, so it's nice to um, join you all these years later. <laughs> all right, uh, let's. I want to start by acknowledging that um, this is really largely what I'm talking about today, the work of Sean McAllister, who was a, a PhD student in my lab, and now he's at NOAA, working with Dave Butterfield, uh, and also at the University of Washington. Um, also, my current um, postdoc and research associate, Jessica Keffer, and former master student Rebecca Vanzura. And the bioinformatics would not have been possible with the help of Sean Polson. Um, all right, so no surprise, <laughs> I'm talking about iron and in particular iron oxidation. Um, we're, there are a lot of different organisms that can oxidize iron with these variety of metabolisms. And the focus of our research lab is on microaerophilic iron oxidizers or organisms that couple the oxidation of iron two to iron three with the reduction of oxygen. Although we'll also talk a bit about denitrification at the end. So the abbreviation that we use for iron oxidizing bacteria is FEOB, and there are archaea as well, but the organisms that we study are bacteria. So FEOB. The question I get a lot from geochemists is, you know, why does it matter, right? The earth is rusting, iron is oxidizing, who cares if it's a microbe or not? 
And other than you know, the fact that we love the little critters, <laughs> what we're interested in is not just iron oxidation, but all the other biogeochemical cycles that um, cascade from there. And in particular, in the second part of my talk, I'm going to talk about the connections to carbon and nitrogen cycling. And so the answer to why does it matter is that iron oxidation fuels carbon and nitrogen cycling um, through carbon fixation and the cascade of heterotrophy, nitrogen fixation, assimilation, denitrification, et cetera, right? If iron oxidation makes a cell, a lot of these things have to happen. So they connect the iron to the nutrient cycles. These organisms are all over the place. So I've spent the better part of my career going to various field sites, looking for iron oxidizers and anywhere where we have iron and an electron acceptor, we can culture, grow and detect iron oxidizers, including the deep sea, which will be the focus of the talk, but to our coasts. So this is the Chesapeake Bay and let me get my pointer. Um, Delaware is on this side, and I'm actually right here. Um, Washington, D.C. is down here. New York is in this direction. Um, and here's the Chesapeake Bay. Um, iron oxidizers are not only in our marine waters, they're in our sediments, they're in our groundwater, they rest the actual crust, uh, in other words, rocks. Basically, at oxic and oxic interfaces, wherever iron rich waters meet uh, oxygenated waters. So groundwater seeps, water wells, um, roots bring oxygen down into anoxic sediments, right? Wherever this happens is a really great place to be a microaerophilic iron oxidizer because you get a flux of iron too and a flux of oxygen. And these organisms make iron oxyhydroxides, which are very sticky and they adsorb various metals, phosphate, organic carbon. And so the microbial oxidation of iron affects a lot of other different cycles, not just through their metabolism, but through this production of these sticky iron oxides. And so we want to be able to detect and quantify their activity in the environment and their contributions and to understand where in the environment microbes are oxidizing iron versus abiotic processes, because this is really not well understood. And so this is really the focus of our work. You can do this via kinetics and you can do this via um, looking for genes. And we're gonna talk about both of these, but I'm gonna start with kinetics. All right, so it's microbes versus chem abiotic chemistry. Microaerophiles thrive where there's low oxygen. So why is this? It's because the abiotic oxidation rate is directly proportional to the concentration of oxygen. And so to compete, right, at high oxygen, the iron is going to disappear, right? The food is going to disappear. Low oxygen is going to stick around for for longer because the abiotic chemical oxidation rate is slow. So these neutrophiles like to hang out where there's low oxygen or no oxygen. Right? All right, so, but that's the principle of it. Let's actually try to quantify that. And so with George Luther's lab, George is also here at the University of Delaware, um, we can use kinetics experiments to quantify the rates of microbial iron oxidation and then the rates of abiotic oxidation. Uh, and then we can uh, determine the proportion of the rates at different oxygen concentrations to really understand what quantitatively is the niche of microaerophilic iron oxidizers. And so you could see the concentration of oxygen in micromolar here and the percent of 
biotic oxidation here. And at 10 micromolar oxygen, this particular organism, which I'll tell you more about, Mary Profundus ferrooxidans, completely dominates the iron oxidation. That is, all iron oxidation is microbial under these particular experimental conditions at 10 micromolar oxygen. And then over, you know, it decreases as you increase it with oxygen, but over the sort of tens of micromolar range, microbes can compete. And these are concentrations that we find at oxic, anoxic transition zones. These are not unusual concentrations, they're quite common. And so microbes can compete and they can be a significant mechanism for iron oxidation at these concentrations. So we can use kinetics, um, and I'll, I'll show you not just on isolates, but also environmental samples to show this. But it is laborious. <laughs> you can't do it with every sample. Uh, there are some caveats and there are some kinds of samples you can't use it in. And so we also, look for a genetic marker because isotopes are of no use here, unfortunately. Um, and so we need a genetic marker of iron oxidation. And the way that we've been looking for this is to first use comparative genomics of isolate genomes and metagenomes, and then try to look for a candidate uh, gene, and then try to verify and validate this through the use of uh, omics and biochemistry, and then also compare uh, the different sequences and see you know, if particular iron oxidizers all have the same sequence. So that's going to be uh, the first part of my talk today. So first I'll introduce you to the site, the uh, Louis Louis Seamount, which is a site from which we got the samples that I'll talk about in parts two and three. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit more about Mary Profundus. Then the second part is about how we use uh, genomics and metatranscriptomics to validate the iron oxidation genes. And I'll put a little bit at the end about, uh, of that section about the biochemistry. And then the third section is about using that, a subset of that omics data set to connect the iron oxidation with what kinds of carbon and more specifically nitrogen cycles uh, are going on in these mats and how iron oxidation drives carbon and nitrogen cycling. Okay, so first let's go to the deep sea. Um, the site that we've been working at for a long time back um, starting when I was a postdoc is the Luihi Seamount, which is a underwater volcano off the big island of Hawaii. And we get there via ship and a remotely operated vehicle called Jason. This is a movie showing you, everything in the field of view is an iron microbial mat. And you can see the shimmering fluids that are bringing anoxic iron rich waters into the deep ocean, which has oxygen. And right at this oxic anoxic interface, these mats, which you can see jiggling and falling apart, <laughs> they love to grow. So it's really a, a haven of iron oxidation. And you can see those pieces and I'll show you um, the structure of those pieces in a second. But it's a really great place to be an iron oxidizer. Everything is orange down there. <laughs> this is what the gradients look like. This is a profile taken by Brian Glazer um, by electrochemistry. And so above the mat, you have oxygen. This is in an oxygen minimum zone. And so above the mat, it's about 40 or 50 micromolar oxygen. But right at the surface of the mat, so this is depth, right at the surface of the mat, um, it dives uh, quite steeply. And right at the interface, it's less than the detection limit of the um, electrochemistry electrodes, which is three micromolars. It's a, a little bit high but it's still, it's quite low. So we're at micromolar levels here. Below, the iron is coming up, right? So it's filtering through the mat and you'll see why in a second. And it also takes a deep dive right at the surface. And so you can see at the surface 
of the iron microbial mat, iron too and oxygen are being consumed. And that's a signature of that aerobic iron oxidation metabolism. The organisms that create these mats are these stock forming zeta proteobacteria. Um, Dave Emerson isolated this representative, Mary Profundus ferrooxidans PV1. And it was a focus of my postdoc work in which um, we found that the cell makes this twisted stock full of iron oxyhydroxides, which is the waste product of the metabolism, but they're using it to build the mat, right? And so as it oxidizes iron, it deposits this stock, which then, as I'll show you, forms the framework of the mat. As the cells divide, I didn't realize I can't use my pointer. Um, the stalks also divide and branch, right? And so you actually get this division recorded in the stalks. Those pieces that you saw falling from the mat, we embedded them, the ones that we captured, we embedded them uh, and sectioned them to look at the structure of the mat. And this is a 15 millimeter scale bar. <laughs> okay, so cells are about microns in size um, and the stalks are about micron or a few microns wide. And this entire mat is made of these iron oxyhydroxide waste products. And it's a very porous framework. It, you know, it's sort of a little bit like cotton, um, but more directional. And it's a framework in which other organisms can then colonize and live. And this is the edge of the mat. This is where those little um, twisting cells would be, right? And it's left behind this apartment building for everybody else. And it's porous so the fluids can flow through. These micron size iron oxidizers make these millimeter and centimeter scale mats. This is a half millimeter scale bar, so millimeters. And zooming out, you could see, you know, on the 10 centimeter scale, um, centimeter size mats, meter size, to then across the entire site, kilometer scale, and the mats get to be meter deep plus. This is a whole lot of microbes and a whole lot of microbial iron oxidation. Right? The point is that at the Louis-Hee Seamount and at other deep sea hydrothermal vents, iron oxidizers are the keystone organisms. They're using the energy from iron oxidation to fix carbon, to chemically support microbial communities and also make the physical framework. And so this is a really good place to study microbial iron oxidation and its effects on biogeochemical cycling because it's not affected by um, light-based processes, is not affected by land-based organics, which can complicate matters. All right, so I'm gonna, this section is about how we use, um, how we use a very, very long circuitous route to find and validate iron oxidation genes. And I'll explain later why we didn't take a more classical route. Um, this is the basis of Sean's paper that was published in M Systems. Um, so you can see the details there. So this is kind of an old slide, but basically the principle of it is this. We have a whole lot of genomes. We didn't have a whole lot of iron oxidizer genomes once upon a time, but over time, uh, we isolated different iron oxidizers and we were able to sequence their genomes laboriously. <laughs> so, and then look to see whether or not these organisms all have the same genes in common. Is a little pie in the sky, right? These are very different kinds of organisms. Um, and now we have SAGs and MAGs, et cetera. And we were surprised that actually the answer was that yes, <laughs> there is a, a gene <laughs> in common. And that gene is a cytochrome 
that is referred to as Site 2 or cytochrome C2 originally characterized in acidothiobacillus feroxidans, an acidophilic iron oxidizer famous for being in acid mine drainage. And you can't really tell on this tree, but these branches are very long. And if, if you just blast this, you don't get all of these others because the sequences are so divergent. Um, for reasons I won't go into, but um, when I went on my sabbatical uh, a while ago, I, I walked the blast and found more and more and more and more sequences. And there was a day I remember um, that I walked the blast far, uh, far enough that I found cytochrome 572, which was a cytochrome I worked on in grad school. <laughs> <laughs> from leptospirillum from the Iron Mountain acid mine drainage site. And I had done some biochemistry on it to help verify that it actually oxidized iron. Um, okay, so this is, a, this is all to say that this is a very big wide ranging tree with a lot of different sequences, including iron oxidizing bacteria and other bacteria. Um, but in particular, the microaerophilic iron oxidizers are all in this part of the tree hanging out with the chlorobi. So the gallinellaceae are here. These are the freshwater iron oxidizers. And the zeta proteobacteria are mostly here. Right, so including Mary Profundus PV1. But this part of the tree has no functional verification. And because of the distance between these sequences, we can't take for granted that these are also iron oxidases, right? This one has been verified. This one has been verified, but we don't have any information over here. And so that was the purpose of our work is to figure out if these genes and the protein that they include encode, if these are iron oxidases, because if so, then we can use this gene to track iron oxidation. Um, I'll tell you right now that the answer is not super simple. <laughs> All right, so what did we do? We went on these cruises, uh, sampled these iron microbial mats, and sequenced uh, the metagenomes and binned them into individual genomes to get a whole bunch of genomes to analyze and compare. And to look at activity, we did incubation experiments where we added iron and oxygen and monitored the transcriptomic response over time to see if these genes were affected by the influx of iron. And so we didn't just go on one cruise, <laughs> we went on three um, around the globe. So including the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and the Marianas. So we covered the globe, um, iron oxidizers everywhere. It took a while. And in our library of samples, we ended up with a library of zeta proteobacteria. The cultured organisms, this will come as no surprise, all cluster there. We basically isolate the same thing over and over and over and over again, except Dave uh, has isolated these Giorcia over here, right? But for the most part, we all keep on getting the same organisms. There's probably a reason for that. But it turns out that the zeta proteobacteria are much more diverse than that. And one of the questions is whether or not all of these are iron oxidizers. It's kind of circular argument here, but stay with me for a while. And do they all, I can't read my own slide, but basically are they all um, iron oxidizers and do they all have an iron oxidation gene? Um, you can read about these wonderful organisms Sean wrote a review in FEMS um, about this. And also these OTUs are based on 16S, but they're mapped to genomes. This is a concatenated ribosomal protein tree. Um, you can actually classify your own zeta proteobacteria using zeta hunter. From these three cruises and many samples, we're able to fill out this tree in terms of whole genomes. So the metagenome assembled genomes so that we could learn more about these other organisms that are not just the isolates, right? 
um, throughout the rest of this uh, section, I will have this zeta proteobacteria tree that's color coded to show you the diversity of the organisms that we're finding. So all the colors um, correspond. We're able to see um, the activity through the metatranscriptome. And so these bar graphs, this is a horrid bar graph um, slide from Loewy He, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and then Marianas. These different samples, we have 16S, we have metagenomes, and then we also have the activity via metatranscriptome. So there's at least three for each sample here. Right. And for, in large part, the metatranscriptome looks like the metagenome, that is, who is in the sample. Those are all active, um, with the exception of the ones that we perturbed, right, those um, incubation experiments. And th we, that represents a lot of the different zeta proteobacteria. So we're at, we chose these samples this way uh, to represent the whole tree. Okay. So now that we have all of these different zeta proteobacteria, let's look for this gene and let's look for an entire putative <laughs> aerobic iron oxidation pathway. So we're looking for the pathway and we're asking whether or not they all have this seg2 gene. Right. And the answer <laughs> is yes, um, except for this OTU2, which was actually had some assembly problems. Right? So I wouldn't count that one. Um, the answer is yes. So these, this dot plot, these circles are the percent of genomes in that particular tax, uh, subtaxa, this is the OTU, that had this. And basically, you know, some of those genomes are not complete, right? So that partly accounts for the less than 100%. Um, all of these ZOTUs have seg2. Is that significant? Is that not significant? Well, let's look at the rest of the pathway, right? The rest of the pathway is a mix and match of different genes. And so as we look at the whole genomes and what genes they do and don't have, I think it's actually quite striking the zeta proteobacteria have this gene. <laughs> um, so, zooming out and looking at all those genomes. So this is an AMVO plot. AMVO is a program that helps us look at pan genomes and compare genomes. Um, every single line here is a genome. Every column is essentially a gene. It's a gene cluster. And the dark boxes are genes that are present in that genome, organized by ZOTU. And so you can see there's some genes that all organisms have. And then there are some genes that only some have. As we look through those genes and look for other metabolisms besides iron oxidation, what struck us was that there really wasn't anything. <laughs> we saw a little bit of hydrogen oxidation in the, some of the ZO2-9s. Those are the Giorcia. We saw a little bit of arsenite oxidation. But other than that, there was nothing recognizable. And this suggests that this class of proteobacteria are entirely iron oxidizers, which is actually quite remarkable. There's no other class that I know of, at least in the proteobacteria or the former proteobacteria that all do the same thing. And so it suggests that there's something difficult are challenging that there are multiple adaptations required to oxidize iron that give particular classes, this class, a corner on the market. Um, and that perhaps, you know, that's their niche and they don't need to do other things. Okay, so they all have this gene, but are they using it? And so this is where we get to the metatranscriptomes, which we've mapped to individual genomes as colored here. And this graph it shows you the percentile gene expression. So 100 percentile mean it is the top expressed gene in that genome. And on average, those genomes, the Psych2, this putative iron oxidation gene, averages 93.4, meaning it is 
one of the highest, if not the highest expressed gene for each of these genomes. And you see some lower values, particularly for this part of the um, tree, the deeper branching zeta proteobacteria, but they're still actually very high. And so this suggests to us that this gene is quite important to this organism. But does the expression correspond to iron oxidation? And this is where we use the incubation experiments. And so over time, so this axis here is time, we monitor the concentration of iron, which is on a log scale here. And over time, as iron two is oxidized, the concentration drops. And then for good measure, we kill them at because we know that there's some abiotic iron oxidation. And then we monitor oxidation again. And we see that live mats, as the microbes, oxidize iron much faster than the minerals that are remaining in the mat. Right? And so we know that the, largely the iron oxidation is microbial. And then we can follow the gene expression. And so we follow the gene expression of the whole pathway. Um, and we can see it goes up, the darker color is up, after we add iron two. How much does it go up? This axis on this graph is full change. And so if there were no change, it would be one, right? If it were a decrease, it would be below the line. But all of those dots are above the line. For both the Loihi Seamount sample and the Marianas backyard sample, we see an increase. Overall, not a huge increase, but when you start to look at individual genomes, um, and Sean has numbered them them here by their relative, their abundance, right? The most abundant to less abundant. Um, you see differences in the full change, that is differences in the amount of stimulation of gene expression. And so that probably ties to the diversity of the Zetas and their individual niches. But overall, we do see responsiveness to iron um, and the ones that were less responsive may simply have already been prepared, right? They, they live to oxidize iron. They were prepared. Whenever it comes around, they're going to oxidize iron. And then there are some that uh, maybe are a bit lazier and won't express the gene as highly until they see iron, right? But there is an increase in expression in response to iron. So we say, that, yes, um, it does correspond. And thus far, this roundabout <laughs> uh, omics experiment over three cruises, supports Seq2 as an iron oxidation gene. Uh, and so it helps validate it as the iron oxidation gene, although it's not the gold standard of proof. For that, we turn to biochemistry. Because these organisms are hard to culture in quantity, we can't just go and grow a bunch of them, purify the protein, the native protein, and test the activity of that protein. Um, the iron oxides make that hard, the yield makes that hard as well. And so we chose a heterologous expression approach in which we put the gene from PV1, the Seq2 gene, into an E. coli, expressed the protein, and then tried to purify the protein, and then assay it. Um, this was years of work <laughs> in one slide um, by Jessica Keffer and others. And we were able to enrich it well enough so that we could, it was the only cytochrome and we could monitor its activity using UV vis spectra. And when we add iron in the form of iron citrate, we can see that uh, electron transfer to the cytochrome and we can actually show that the site two oxidizes the iron or accepts the electron from iron two. Furthermore, we can quantify the redox potential. And so this in the lower left um, is a diagram of the iron oxidation chain. This is millivolts here, right? So the iron two, iron three redox potential where iron three is a very hydrate. We able to quantify the Seq2 redox potential is about 200 millivolts, uh, which makes sense because it's between the iron couple and oxygen. And then of course we have reverse electron transport. And so that's good, that makes sense. You know, it's not here, it's not down here, right? It's, it makes sense as a, a redox potential to take electrons from iron. 
And so overall, our functional evidence also bears it out that the Psych2 protein can in vitro oxidize iron. And so, you know, we move to more obvious experiments um, that were previously limited by isolates. Isolates mostly only oxidize iron, and so they're not amenable to differential expression. But uh, one of Dave Emerson's isolates, Sideroxidens lithotrophicus, this is a terrestrial isolate, um, does also grow on thiosulfate, and so we can conduct differential gene expression experiments. And so this is work that Nanqing Zhou has been doing, and I'm just going to give you um, the basic answer that, um, you know, does Psych2 expression correspond to iron oxidation in this isolate? The answer is yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's complicated. And so it's more than I can tell you now, but she has submitted a Goldschmidt abstract and she's also preparing a paper. So look out for both of those. Okay, so um, it's 37 past an hour. So I think I will give you the, um, the basics of this section. Um, because it's also in a recent ISME publication, basically about how these, I've been telling you about the aerobic zeta proteobacteria and the iron oxidation gene, but how that work has enabled us to discover an anaerobic iron oxidizer in these same mats and how these two work together to cycle carbon and nitrogen and drive denitrification. So I showed you this plot before, that this is a gradient environment, but it's not only a gradient of oxygen, iron, but also nitrogen. So this is Jason Sylvan and Scott Wankel's work in which they measured nitrate and ammonia gradients across the mat. And you can also see that there's active nitrogen cycling. And so we've been mostly talking about what happens up at the surface of the mat, but now we also want to know what's going on down deeper and what's going on with the nitrogen cycle, particularly denitrification. And who is doing it? Do they each do their own thing um, or is it all connected? <laughs> and so we go back to the sampling of these iron mats and you can see a vent here. And I just wanna show you that we can sample very precisely the surface of the mat using these syringes. So we're up on the ship um, using an iPad <laughs> um, via the ro uh, robot to activate these plungers. This is the slurp gun in which we can take a large amount of mat liters. And this is a scoop in which, uh, which we also take a, fa a fairly large amount. And so mostly with the scoop and the slurp, we're taking deep mat. And with the syringe, we're able to just take the surface and therefore differentiate what's going on the surface. So that's the S1 shallow mat versus the S6 and the S19 bulk mat. And when we look at just the 16S or the um, meta uh, genome or the metatranscriptomes, the surface is almost all zeta proteobacteria. And that's what we would expect. But down deep, it's much more diverse. And in particular, this dark purple bar is this novel uncharacterized phylum called DTB120. And I'll tell you about an organism based on the genomes that we've recovered, which we've named fairy stratum. This organism, uh, when we started this work, it was actually classified as a delta proteobacteria. Um, but it was quite distant from other deltas and now it's its own phylum. And even uh, the organisms that we found, they're closely related to other hydrothermal vent organisms, but distantly related from the closest cultured relative. And so basically we have no idea, you know, just from the taxonomy, what this organism could do. Stepping back for a moment, when we reconstruct the various genomes and we look for the genes, the biogeochemically related functional genes, we can reconstruct not only iron cycling, but also the carbon cycle and the nitrogen cycle in these maps and see that 
there's active cycling. And I'm just gonna tell you about part of this, but I wanted to show you kind of the big picture here. We can figure out who is doing what, not just from the metagenomes and the individual mags, but mapping the transcriptomes to those mags. And we see all of these different biogeochemical pathways. If we look particularly at the genes and their expression levels, we can figure out what are the major functions in the mat. And so the darker blue colors here are higher expression by TPM. And this is on a log scale here. And so the darkest blue we see here for all these different electron donors is, no surprise, <laughs> iron oxidation, right? And when we look at who is doing it in the surface, this S1 mat, and then deeper, we got a surprise, right? The surface, as we imagine, are the zeta proteobacteria. But deeper down, most of the site two expression is actually by this novel organism and the DTB120. And just to make sure that this site two gene was not a contamination, right? Not some zeta proteobacteria site two that just ended up in the mag. There are about 10 mags. Um, we treat it and we find that it is within this cluster one hanging out near these other known iron oxidizers. And that was a huge for the excitement that Rebecca and Sean had when they discovered that. Okay, so what are they breathing? Right. Again, the darker blue, but kind of grayish blue colors here, correspond to oxygen and nitrate, the NARGH is a denitrification gene. And the organisms that are breathing oxygen are on the top are zeta proteobacteria, but down deep, um, these, the nitrate reduction is these DTB120 ferrostratum organisms. So these are denitrifiers largely, right? And that makes sense, they're deeper in the mat. This is one part of this nitrogen cycling that we have reconstructed, but an important part. In the time I have left, what I wanna do is go through what we discovered about the Zeta and the DTB120 roles in nitrogen cycling to show how iron oxidation then cascades into um, nitrogen cycling. And the gory details are in Sean's uh, M Systems paper in which we took each individual mag and looked at the nitrogen uh, cycling gene content and the expression levels. And so this is a genome by genome uh, analysis, but I am just going to show you the cartoons. <laughs> so it turns out that zetas are also denitrifiers. They assimilate nitrate. That's their main source of nitrogen. And so to assimilate, you have to reduce. But also they have NAPA. Some of them have NAPA, um, which we think is serves as a backup um, breathing source, right? That it's in this low oxygen environment. And when they run out of oxygen, some of them have the option to denitrify as you know, electron sink. Fairy stratum is found mostly in the bulk mat. So that is mostly deeper down. And they're expressing the NARGH. They mostly don't um, have the ability to breathe oxygen. Um, and so because they have that site two gene, we naturally ask, you know, are they nitrate reducing iron oxidizers? Um, I should also say that you can see here, the zeta proteobacteria are fixing carbon and the DTB120 don't have the ability to fix carbon. So they're also taking advantage of that fixed carbon. And so they're connected in these various ways. And so this is where we go back to the microcosm incubation experiment in which we added iron to the mat and we showed that the mat is actively oxidizing iron. We can follow the activity of the different taxa over time, and then we can follow their individual gene expression. So this dotted line is where we added iron, and then you can see the response over time. And actually the zeta proteobacteria activity decreases and then increases. But soon after the addition of iron, the DTB120 fairy stratum actually increases. 
and then decreases. And so this differing response uh, is further evidence of their different niches. And probably when we add iron two, it, it goes maybe not quite anaerobic, but definitely um, a lower redox potential for a short time. And that would be representative of conditions deeper in the mat. And so it makes some sense that DTB120 would bloom first, right? Respond first, and then the zeta period bacteria. If we look at the expression of the iron oxidation genes, the Psych2, we see much the same, that the zetas respond later. They do respond, but they respond later. And the fairy stratum respond right away, within two minutes, right? That the Psych2 uh, expression peaks. And at the same time, and this is before the overall expression peaks, at the same time, the NARG, the denitrification gene peaks. And so this is evidence that these two respond, both respond to the addition of iron two. And it's a way that we link the two, right? We're not culturing it. We don't know absolutely what its metabolism is, but we use this as evidence that this is very possibly a denitrifying iron oxidizer that's hanging out and living with an aerobic iron oxidizer. And so I won't go through all the conclusions because I want to finish up, but basically there are these two iron oxidizers living together using the energy of iron oxidation and the ability of the zetas to fix carbon to then denitrify, right, together. And also we were able to use this gene, Psych2, to, to discover new iron oxidizers, potential putative iron oxidizers, and reconstruct the biogeochemical cycling and the connections between the iron, the carbon, and the nitrogen in this iron, oxidi uh, iron oxidizing fueled <laughs> system. And overall, I just wanna leave you with the thought that iron oxidizers are everywhere. <laughs> and we now have developed tools to be able to detect their presence and to some extent their activity. There's still a lot of work to be done. It does appear that Psych2 is an iron oxidation gene and protein, um, but I will caution you that the answer is not so simple. Um, and, but, it does allow us to help understand the biogeochemical effects of iron oxidizers in the environment. And that's it. Thanks, Clara, that's fantastic. It, you're, the story about the ecology of the mats is amazing. And, and your slides, I must say, the, the cycles that you, you, you show in the mapping of the um, expression back into the mags it, within the mats, that's really beautiful slides. Thank you for, for a great talk. And so we'll open up for, for a few lucky questions now in the time that we have. And the rest of you might just have to be satisfied with finding the gory details in one or more of those papers that Clara was um, good enough to include in her slides so that we've got the references to chase. So let's see, I've got a question in here in the chat from Rosa. Hi, Rosa. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, you're just saying brilliant talk and really fascinating. Thank you. So thanks Rosa for the, for the comment. Are there any questions um, for Clara? For those of you who joined us late, she's got to run off and teach pretty soon. So we'll have to limit the questions a bit today. If not, I'll start us off if you don't mind. Um, could I ask you a quick question about the, you said the, uh, the Psych2 is, is one of the genes in pot potentially, if I understood correctly, a, a pathway for iron oxidation. And so if Psych2 alone can oxidize iron two in your experimental assays, what are the other genes in the pathways responsible for, or, or did I misunderstand that? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, I think the investigation of the acidothiobacillus iron oxidation pathway is, you know, it took a long time. It's a cautionary tale, right? Um, so we showed that Psych2 can oxidize iron, but lots of cytochromes can <laughs> participate in redox reactions, but it does have a reasonable redox potential. Um, but the cautionary tale about acidothiobacillus is they originally thought that rustocyanin was the iron oxidase, 
right? And then they discovered site two. And it turns out that you know, through Cindy Castell's work and Yarizabel and others, um, there's a whole complex of proteins that are involved, um, quite a few of them. And so we're under no um, illusions that my very, very simple <laughs> cartoon is everything, right? There's a lot that we don't know. I actually took out the question marks. Um, and we see a lot of different cytochromes in these genomes. And so surely some of them are also participating. And through our differential exper expression experiments, we're trying to narrow down the candidates for the rest of the electron transport pathway. But there are certainly periplasmic electron carriers that are other cytochromes and then inner membrane proteins that then shuttle those electrons to the other, um, the other units then to oxygen and reverse electron transport. Those may also be markers, right? Especially those periplasmic cytochromes because rustocyanin is actually, I think it's a pretty good marker as well, but it's not the iron oxidase. And so we're hopeful that we can reconstruct this pathway and also use as expression as cool. a sign of activity. Um, I see we've got a question about the stocks and I'm going to push that one up because I was actually wondering that too. The, the stocks are quite striking. Is there anything particularly special or unique about stock formation, stock geometry, and why these microbes that oxidize iron make these things? It's one of my favorite subjects and I could go on and on. <laughs> um, but I do think so. So I think of these as little tiny architects, right? And they've optimized over time the shape, um, they're rigid. Um, the twisting is probably partly a chemotactic um, response. There are, um, there are chemotactic receptors at both poles. Um, so that's probably the reason for the shape. They don't always twist. Um, there's actually a double set of filaments and I think that gives it structural stability. So you can see these individual um, lines here, right? There's two lines of those. And I think that actually gives it partly, not just the rigidity, but the structural stability as well. Oh, you mean in the thickness dimension, two, mm -hmm. two layers. Oh, wow, I didn't notice that until you just pointed it out. Yeah, that's cool. Um, we've got a question about whether your, any of your um, experimental um, organisms can accept electrons from electrodes rather than iron two. Yeah, so that, um, so that's something that Jeff Gronick and Dan Bond have worked on, especially with PV1. The Mary profundus can, but it doesn't grow. Um, I have lots of thoughts about why that might be. Um, there are some multi-heme cytochromes in some of these organisms that are probably more well-suited to oxidizing um, solid substrates, including iron two minerals. Um, we're working on the oxidation of iron two smectites as well. Um, so we think that maybe the multi-heme cytochromes might be better at that. Um, but, you know, keep in mind that iron two, dissolved iron two can also act as its own shuttle, right? And so if you have a little bit in the system, um, it may be that the site two can oxidize iron two and then the iron two can then interact with the solid surface um, and be a shuttle. Of course, there are other shuttles as well. Yeah, Do so we don't know, good question. <laughs> Do you have time for a last question? Yeah. I realize you've got to get off for teaching, but um, so the question is about other metals. Is like too specific for iron too, or can it oxidize anything else? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in principle, it should be able to oxidize other things, right? But that's part of why we wanted to check its redox potential mm -hmm. because it's well poised. This particular one is well poised to oxidize iron too. Um, but very, you know, cytochromes are pretty well known to be promiscuous, right? But I think that there are probably other features of this structure that optimize it for iron two, because iron two is kind of sticky, right? It could get stuck in this outer membrane cytochrome. Um, I think that the chemistry is probably um, suited to getting the iron out as well. Um, but that would probably apply to other metals too. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Clara. And I'm apologizing to the audience. I'm afraid that's all we're going to have time for today because Clara's got a teaching commitment in about less than five minutes. So thanks, <laughs> thanks again, Clara, for a great talk and joining us today from the East Coast of the US where it's still early for you. Um, we really appreciate your time.